when you look back at the process of writing the novel, what what are your recollections of maybe what was uh, what were the books you were reading at the time, or what were the uh, I guess the clothes you were wearing or looking into <laughs> or any clothes? Well, I think it, it wasn't so much what I was reading or wearing; it's really more what I was thinking about, and I've been thinking for quite a long time about the question of monsters and the idea that that um, people who've experienced great suffering, you expect them to turn into saints, into lovely people, um, and not to you know, oppress or exploit others. And it occurred to me that if that was the case, then you know, we would never have heard of people like Nelson Mandela or Primo Levi. You know, those people are exceptional because they can rise above their suffering, but most people don't. So what I was interested in was writing about somebody who you know, was a monster, uh, but had experienced great suffering, and to try to kind of you know work out you know what that was all about. You were, uh, the character of Uncle Sandor was um, was modeled off of this nefarious uh, Peter Rackley, mm-hmm. who was uh, kind of this landlord who mm-hmm. ran roughshod over Notting Hill in the mm-hmm. in the sixties. Maybe you could uh, explain why this is a character that intrigued you enough to to base, base a fictional character on. Um, Peter Ackerman was, was, he died in 1962 and he was very famous for quite a short period of time in the late 50s and early 60s because he was a slum landlord in Notting Hill Um, and he was notorious for renting terrible, terrible, terrible rooms to um, the first immigrants, immigrants to Britain from the Caribbean. Um, so it wasn't just that people were being kept in terrible conditions but they were so that they were black. And um, the other thing about him was that he was the lover of um, two people who were very famous in the early 60s, Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis, who were young call girls who eventually brought down the government um, because um, they were sleeping around with some very, very high-profile people. Um, And so he was all mixed up with that. And he, he died, you know, quite young at the age of 42, and his name went into the dictionary. Rachmanism became the word he used, this you know, certain kind of slum landlordism. And people still use it today. But what was interesting about him was that he was also a Jewish Holocaust survivor. Um, he was Polish. And um, I was really very interested to try to understand why somebody who had been through these you know, terrible, terrible experiences, as he had should have turned into a slum landlord. Um, And he arrived in Britain um, just after the war. Um, And so he seemed to me to be a sort of an interesting and intriguing figure. And in fact, somebody else about 20 years ago wrote a play about him. So he's someone who has rather captured the imagination in in England. Obviously, the book has been critically acclaimed and uh, Mm -hmm. and culminating in a uh, shortlisting for the Booker Prize. Mm -hmm. What were your reactions to that? What were... um, was that a surprise? Was it? Uh... Um, well, you know, it's it's a long process, <laughs> which which actually begins at the end of July when they announced the long list, and the long list is quite a short long list. It only had thirteen books on it, and then it goes down to six, sort of six weeks later. So it was a kind of, you know, a sort of, you know, you get you go through these various hoops, and you're kind of, you know, waiting for the next stage, and and you know that, you know, when you get shortlisted for the booker, suddenly the eyes of the world, it seems, it feels like, are on you. Because, you know, the, you, know you can go to the bookmakers and you get odds on, on yourself and people are putting money on you. And you think, no, don't, don't waste your money, please. Um, and then you go to this sort of, you know, incredibly elaborate black tie dinner. Um, you're sort of on a table with your publishers and everybody, all the other authors are on a table with your publishers. And, you know, it's just endlessly, endlessly nerve-wracking. And my feeling about it was, please make it stop. Mm. (laughs) And when they announced the winner, and I thought, oh, thank God, it's not (laughs) me, because now I can go, you know, now all this can come to an end. So do you feel more, I mean, is there, I guess, is there an added pressure now for you as a writer? You've been on kind of both sides, you've been the the, the journalist and the subject. Mm -hmm. Now, is there more, with all that attention from the press and from, you say, yeah. everybody, is there more pressure on you now? Well, I, I mean, I, actually, I sort of feel that there's less pressure in a strange kind of way because I think, you know, it, it's an illusion not to think that everybody really would like to be on the shortlist for the booker. 
And I think kind of once you've done it, then you think, okay, right, you know, I've, I've achieved that now. And you know you have a kind of one in six chance of winning and it's really futile to, you know, to hope to win. And I didn't, which meant that I had a better time. Um, but no, I, I, I sort of feel that slightly more liberated now, actually. I just feel I can write what I want, That's you know? How, how might you be a different writer if, if, if your background wasn't in journalism or if you didn't have that? Well, um... As a journalist, what I really liked doing was getting, working my way into the houses of complete strangers and getting them to tell me their secrets. Um, and a lot of the time, when they were telling me things and I was interviewing them, I would often think that would be a much better story if it was more like this, you know, if, uh, if this had happened or if it happened in a different order or if this was more significant. Um, and I always remember, you know, I would come back and I would be quite irritated that, you know, I knew how to make this a better story because you couldn't, because you had to stick to the truth. But it did give you this unprecedented access to, you know, to other people. And I always tried to keep away from opinion writing polemic. Uh, and I never did any straight news reporting. So it was always a matter of, you know, my very deep curiosity about, you know, other people and other people's lives. And it sort of took me to places that I would never have gone to. Um, but in the end, what I think what a writer of fiction wants and craves is the power and control over what they're writing about, uh, which you can't get in journalism, unfortunately, unless you're, if you're, unless you're deeply dishonest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As many are. Right, yeah. Well, maybe we, can, uh, maybe we can sample some of this uh, honesty. This is um, just a a section um, in which um, this, you know, this young girl has discovered that she has an uncle who's um, this notorious slum landlord, and she's been brought up um, by her parents to know absolutely nothing about him. And she goes to meet him, and he tells her his story. And this is a little bit in which he describes um, what uh, happened during the war. And she says, it is very strange to realize that when you see those old films on television of the toothbrush moustache dictator ranting and the mass rallies and the stiff arm salutes and all the marching up and down and the well-known flag standing to attention, the, that famous menace and what it would lead to, all of it was happening while people went on buying shoes and handbags and party dresses and gramophone records and ornaments and choosing a new car or a new wireless set or just sitting in a cafe eating cream cakes. And while they were doing all that, the signs were there on the streets, such as the sign of the Arrow Cross men, the Hungarian fascists, which my uncle drew for me on a sheet of paper. I have to keep remembering that he was only 22 in 1938, two years younger than the age I was then, the summer of 1977, when I knew him. Like me, he had a taste for and an interest in flashy, unusual clothes, he wanted things that were all the rage, and he used to mooch around the shops looking for the latest fashions, would go to the cinema and look carefully at what the film stars were wearing and see if he could find copies. A few months later, he would march off to labour service in a suit which would not leave his back for a further four and a half years. Mm -hmm. 